Good, good morning, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't be here yesterday. It's a bit of a complicated time in, uh, in my life. I also apologize that I have to keep these FFP2 masks. I'm immunosuppressed, so it's better for me uh, uh, to be here instead of by Zoom, but to still keep uh, uh, protecting a bit. Uh, as I'm not sure my blood cell, white blood cells are working as well as the one I will uh, show you in a, in, a, in a few minutes. So my role today first is to identify the immunologists in the room. So I always make sure that there are some really good immunologists. So where is Marilyn? Over there. Who, are, who else are the immunologists? Can you please raise your hands? One, two, three, four, five. H higher because I will pick on your brain. Very good. Oh, good. So. This lecture is not for you, but I will pick on your brain if I can't answer questions. And I would love your feedback on how you teach immunology in your circles, because I think this is a challenging uh, 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 and a challenge which I enjoy very much and I always learn from, from feedbacks. Now, who hates immunology? is afraid of immunology, runs away whenever they hear immunology, never heard of immunology for the last 40 years. All together, how many? Okay, this lecture is for you. <laughs> and I will be fired, which means not invited next year, if I lose you on the way. So, because the time is limited, I will focus on the principles which I think you need to understand, not put here and then stuck here, but really understand and use throughout the course in order to understand how do vaccines work and how about all these vaccines that you're going to hear about. So I will uh, manage this uh, in, in, in my way. I will be asking you questions. We will take breaks several times for questions as we go. It will be a less bit more, a, a less, less formal than written on the agenda, you know, speak, break, speak, break, uh, uh, and discuss a bit in, in the middle, and we'll see uh, uh, how we go. Okay? So, um, this being said, the question of today is really how may vaccine induce protection? And regardless of whether you use any type of vaccine, live attenuated, inactivated pathogens, purified antigens with adjuvants, antigen encoded in vectors as we've seen, and these two categories as we've seen being used against COVID. Uh, um, whatever the question is, how do you manage to induce effectors, means something that does something, which is protective, hopefully, specific, because you want it to be specific of the antigen that you induce. Although in some cases like SARS-CoV-2, we would love to have like a pan <laughs> coronavirus vaccine. We will go into an antigen specific uh, 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 process. And we will go through, my objective is for you to be able to replace this question mark by four or five bullet points, which I will highlight as we go. And of course you will have all the slides if they are not yet in, in, in your uh, platform. Um, so uh, what happened first after immunization? Come on, who had a shot in the last year? What happened first? Sorry? Local reaction, yes. How can you, would you word it differently? Pain, it hurts. <laughs> Sometimes we don't cry out loud, but it does hurt. And why does it hurt? Well, it hurts because in fact, what happens is as soon as you in inject something that is foreign in your body, and here it's, you have the muscle. I'm very good at, uh, uh, at drawing. So <laughs> you will have to guess sometimes, but these are muscle fibers in, in your muscle here. And you put some antigen adjuvant, whatever, this is your vaccine. And it sounds, it sends to the body a signal that it's foreign. That does not belong to me. Danger. And this creates an attraction of your white blood cells. We call them monocytes. They become dendritic cells and so on and so on. So they, they have specific names, but you can, you can call them white blood cells. 
And this cell recruitment and activation generates an inflammatory focus, which is responsible for the side getting red, swollen, hurting. And if the inflammation is strong enough, you may be as lucky as to have headache, fever, chills, and everything. It, does mean, it does not mean that the inflammation is all over your body. You're in, the, the foci of inflammation is where you injected this vaccine. But of course, if you generate a lot of inflammation, you're going to have systemic symptoms as well. And we've seen, we see that with, uh, with uh, some, some of our vaccines. So this uh, inflammation uh, occurs at the site of uh, injection because the body detects danger signals. And these danger signals are delivered or generated by vaccines and their different vaccine types and adjuvants and whatever goodies you put with your antigens that is going to say, hey, I'm here. Because otherwise, they just wouldn't care about what you inject in the deltoid more than what you ate at breakfast this morning, just a bit of protein or just let it go. So we need this. And it's not for you to feel less sore that you had a sore harm, but it's, we really need that to get immunization going. Now, these cells do not get a stay forever at the injection site. As you probably all luckily observed, after a couple of days, it hurts less. And in fact, it takes a couple of days for cells to migrate from where it was injected, usually the deltoid in adults, to the draining lymph nodes. So a lymph node is something you may not have heard of, of uh, since a long time, and yet it will be the focus of your attention today because if, if you are ever asked where do immune responses take place, the answer is in the lymph nodes, in the draining lymph nodes. So which lymph nodes? If you inject a vaccine that is non-live, non-replicating, like a bit of inactivated or protein with adjuvants or whatever, it stays where you injected it. The vaccine initially uh, uh, is injected, oops, sorry, of course, that was the wrong button. The vaccine is injected, for example, here, and the antigen will move either taken up by white blood cells or by a simple diff diffusion, it will move toward, drain toward the closest lymph node. And the lymph nodes are organized. This is basic to anatomy, medicine, year one, class one, day one almost. Uh, uh, your uh, immune system is like totally separated right from left, such that if you inject a vaccine on the left deltoid, it's not going to drain into the right uh, lymph nodes, it's going to be drain into the, the um, uh, uh, left axillary lymph nodes. So and the activation is thus mostly local and unilateral. And this has implication. You could say, do I care? Yes, you care. Because this is why we may inject many vaccines at the same time if we need to. Because all we need is to use different sites. And if we need more than two, we need to spread the injection site enough such that it drains toward different lymph nodes within the same area. You see that here, axillary lymph nodes, in fact, there are many, I think 20 or 30 lymph nodes. And uh, a few uh, studies have shown that if you respect the distance of one inch, two and a half centimeter between two vaccines, it's going to drain mostly to different lymph nodes. So for those who do travel immunization, thanks for coming. Um, if for those who do travel immunization, this is how you can catch up 10 vaccines in the, sorry, it's closed um, in, the, in the same time. And uh, another consequence, of course, is you've probably seen, <laughs> can't make it. You've probably seen these type of questions. You know, I had a, my, a COVID uh, mRNA vaccine and two days later, I was positive for COVID by PCR. Isn't it the mRNA from the vaccine which was picked up by the PCR? And it can't be, it just means you are getting COVID on top of your vaccines because the, the, um, the draining is not uh, from the deltoid up into your nose. That the draining is to the lymphatics here 
and then to the uh, circulation and then uh, and so on and so on. Okay, so that's clear. Non-live vaccine, non-replicating, unilateral, focal, limited immune activation. Now, what happens when you inject uh, live replicating vaccines? By the way, which are the live vaccines we are using? MMR, BCG, yellow fever, shingles, yes, BCG, dengue, rotavirus, Japanese encephalitis. There is one, yeah. I think that's about it. Huh? So if you use, and, and then the vector based, uh, 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 like the Ebola vaccine, for example, the, from Merck, the uh, Herbevo vaccine is a replicating vector based, uh, although we don't use it every day. So what happens there is that wherever you inject the vaccine, it's going to multiply, disseminate, and run its life home. Uh, towards a, a specific uh, uh, organs if it has to, and it generates a multifocal lymph node activation such, such that even if you inject it here, the other lymph node area are going to react as well. And as a rule, you can take that for a basis that live vaccine generates stronger and longer and more sustained immune responses than non-live vaccines because they generate much more danger signals and a much, st and a much stronger act immune activation. This is at least part of the, um, of the explanations. They, they, are heard, they are others. And there are concrete uh, implications for those uh, among you who do uh, perform immunizations because, for example, the question could be, um, what rule do you have to follow when you inject MMR? Where do you have to, to inject MMR or not to? Okay, he's got it. Subcutaneous or intramuscular. Why either or? Usually simply because one company developed a vaccine during clinical studies using intramuscular and the other company developed the same vaccine or the brother uh, uh, using sub-Q. But in fact, wherever you inject it, it goes where it wants to go. Um, Sub-Q is a polite way of saying intrafat, which we don't like a lot. Uh, so Sub-Q is more fancy, but in fact, in the fat, th this is where you have the fewer immune cells. So indeed, it's not the best way to inject anything. But a live vaccine is so potent that even if you inject it in fat, it will eventually make its way uh, through muscles and, and then being picked up by antigen presenting cells and so on and so on. Okay. And it means you can inject them as a, a, at any distance and anything because anyhow they will go everywhere uh, they, they want to go. So um, uh, is that clear? Good. If, if anyone is lost, I want to know it as we go, right? So from these innate responses, now we have to generate effectors. And that's the, main, the first uh, bullet point I want you to take home. Vaccines uh, uh, induce protection essentially through two mechanisms, one of which is more imp important than the other. One is antibody responses, and we will see how they are generated. And the second one is T cell responses. So these are the mechanisms through which vaccines protect. So if you look, at the table, this is from uh, the, the Plotkin book or Bible. It's from the previous version, so it doesn't have yet shingles or SARS-CoV-2 or whatever. But you can see that when you look at correlates of vaccine immunity, and this will be a following up lecture, serum IgG, which is immunoglobulin G, is elicited and considered as a correlate of immunity for almost any vaccine. There are beautiful exceptions. BCG is the canonical exception, rotavirus as well. But you see that we are not, oops, I did it again. We are not so good at having vaccines yet that elicit a lot of mucosal antibodies. And that has relevance when we talk about respiratory infections as may come in the discussion. So. Despite the fact that on your paper it says I will spend half of the time talking about B cells and half of the time about T cells, this is not true. I will speak most of the time talking about antibodies, 
and a little bit uh, uh, of the time uh, telling you why we also need uh, uh, T cells because they play an essential role in most vaccines. And sorry for the T cell aficionados, of course, we couldn't do anything without T cells. So why are antibodies so important in mediating protection? The answer is very simple, because they can do a heck of a lot of things, which means a lot of different fun functions. Of course, they can simply bind. This is a dangerous toxin like tetanus, diphtheria, whatever. And they can bind to the side of the toxin and simply detoxify it. That's probably the oldest vaccines, very easy. But they, they can also, if that's now, uh, I have to make sure it's close. Um, if that's now a virus, and this is the receptor for the virus to enter into the cell, into the body, antibodies can also bind to the receptor and then prevent the, the entrance of the virus into the cell. And we call that these neutralizing antibodies. So you've heard that all the time. Binding antibodies means it can bind anywhere. Neutralizing antibodies means in, it binds to the receptors, sometimes there are many, that prevent or allow entry into the cells. Um, when, once you have a, a, a pathogen which is decorated with binding antibodies on the surface, we call that opsonization, just means that it becomes nice and tasty and that it's like the, the best food that uh, uh, white blood cells, dendritic cells could think of. So they just dream of swallowing it because it looks like your favorite food. And we have a fancy word for that, which is um, phagocytosis, which means to swallow. And opsonization or opsonophagocytosis simply means take a bite of this good stuff. So the more you put antibodies on a, a pathogen, the, e the more attractive and the easier it becomes to be swallowed and then degraded and so on. And then in the last couple of years or 10 years, it became clear that antibodies have many additional functions that are, can be very specific and that are linked to the common part of antibodies, not the part that recognize the antigen, which is this part of the, of the what's the name, the cup, uh, but the, the, the FC portion, which is here, which activates the complement, activates uh, killing by different types of cells and so on and so on. And this is a, another very important role uh, of uh, uh, antibodies, whether elicited by immunization or infection. So antibodies through all these mechanisms, what they do is they first cut down the, the number of infecting pathogen, whether viruses or bacteria, by 90% or something like that, simply by binding to everything that they see. Okay, so reduce the, uh, the uh, initial load is, 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 is immediate. You have antibodies, you bind, poof, you're dead. The second thing is they clear pathogens as long as they are outside the cell. Once they are hidden in a cell, of course, you need something else, and this is where T cells come about. And it is because you reduce this pathogen load, the duration, the quantity in your nose and throat, that it reduces uh, the duration of uh, uh, and the extent of uh, transmission and thus induces community protection. And that will be uh, uh, will come in, in subsequent uh, uh, presentation. So it's not because I like B cells, it's just because antibodies are amazing at everything that they can do. Uh, and, and, and there are many more things, of course, these, these are the basics. So now that you are becoming immunology experts, you know that where are antibodies uh, produced, induced, let's say activated and induced, the answer is in the lymph node. So the B cells, uh, the, the, the antigens that are taken up here by white blood cells are being brought into the draining lymph node. And as for now, this is where everything happens and you focus on this white, on this yellow square. And for those who have not looked at a lymph node ever in their life or since the last 40 uh, years, this is the lymph node, this yellow square. And you see that it has, as any organ, it has uh, an artery and a vein to bring in uh, a supply, blood supply and take it away. And it has a capsule all around it. And this capsule 
into these capsules, through these capsules, arrive the lymph vessels that come from the muscles, from the, from the organs, from everything. It comes through there. And then the organization of a lymph node is very specific. It's not like you have B cells and T cells and everything in a chaos. No, it's very structured. In fact, these guys don't speak to each other. You have areas where T B cells cluster together, these dark gray spots. And most of the uh, lymph node is T cells, where T cells are. You have many more T cells in a resting state than, than B cells. So everyone is like sitting in its own garden and, and waiting for something to happen. And now we are going to bring that something and see what happens, okay? So the first thing that happens is uh, when, uh, following in injections is uh, antigen arrives in the lymph node and it arrives through this uh, uh, external sinuses and it is transported, translocated by specific mechanisms you don't need to know about into the B cell zone. And uh, it will bind, antigen arrives, and it will bind only to B cells that have surface receptor capable of binding to a piece of this antigen, right? So if that's the antigen and, I, and I'm a B cell here on, uh, with this end, and this is my surface receptor, I'm searching for something that fits, and wow, this fits really well. And if I'm these B cells and I'm, uh, and I'm searching for something that fits, I say, oh, that's not that good. If it's good enough, maybe I put, can, yeah, I can put it here too. So I will, that will do, not as well as here, but that will do. And so only the B cells who really bind well to the antigens that you, that is reaching the lymph node will receive the a contact with the antigens and uh, uh, start being uh, uh, activated. And we call these uh, surface receptor B cell receptors, but they are really immunoglobulins, so, so uh, antibodies. So these B cells activate, proliferate, and guess what? Uh, they differentiate into antibody secreting cells. And so for uh, one reason or another, we call antibody secreting cells plasma cells. That dates back. Plasma cells. And these plasma cells in the lymph nodes fortunately do not stay there forever. Because otherwise, can you imagine it would be inconvenient walking like that because you would have kept like all your immune system in your. No. So these plasma cells, they uh, migrate out of the lymph node, but they essentially pr will produce some uh, uh, mostly immunoglobulin M and a bit of IgG and IgA. And this goes relatively rapidly, but it's modest and it's transient. And when you look at that on a graph, after you've injected, whether a mice or a human or a non-human primate or whatever, you will see something like that, which is first 10 days, you see not much. You start seeing antibodies appear in the blood against around day 10, 14, depending on how potent your vaccine are is sometimes you see nothing for a month and you say, I say, oh my gosh, I'm done. Um, it peaks around four weeks and then it decays and relatively rapidly goes back to baseline level. So this is what we call a primary antibody response. You give one dose of antigen, you select the B cells that bind best, they become antibody producing cells and you see these antibodies go up and then go down. Okay, you understand why they go up? Now, why do they go down? They go down uh, uh, because, uh, I will tell you in two minutes why they go down. What happens if you bring antigen again in the same lymph node? Isn't that a good question? Yes. What happens if you bring antigen again? Your guess? The same thing. So absolutely, if you're lucky, this is what happens. You get a second primary response. So to illustrate it here is you have your B cells. First time, that's what they do. Second time, that's what they do, copy paste. And so, and so you have the same response as the first time. But if you're less lucky, or if your antigens have used up all the specific B cells, when this guy comes again, this one is not there. 
there are no antigen specific B cells that are capable of binding it because they've been used up in some, something before. And then what do you have? Well, of course, you have a response that is much lower than the primary. And immunologists call that hypo responsiveness. So a lower response than usual. And you probably know with what type of antigens this occurs, right? Polysaccharides. Just remember, sugar is not good for your health. Protein is much better. So whenever you have a vaccine that contains only B cell epitopes, and for example, only sugar, like most polysaccharides, or a few proteins which have very repetitive and boring structure and so on, there are, of course, mechanical reasons for that, but I don't have to go into unless you ask me to. You can have either a, a similar or a weaker secondary response and the protection will be very transient. And the implication for clinicians who use polysaccharide vaccines is that unfortunately we had to give them very repeatedly. And if we give them too frequently, the responses go down and down. And if we wait too long, we escape protection before we can give the next dose. And this is why polysaccharide vaccines are being replaced by conjugate vaccines, which is basically a sugar plus a protein, because sugar is not good for your health, protein is much better. That's a, a way of uh, remembering uh, uh, that. So I think here I should have a question mark, and probably there are a few questions. Yes, please just remember to say who you are, and so you get some of the prices that we deliver at the end. Uh, my name is Elke from Switzerland. I have a question. You said when the antigen hits the lymph nodes, there are some B cells that recognize them, but where do they come from? Because they have never, they may have never seen that antigen if it's new. So how, how can there be some that can recognize this? Okay, thank you for the question. So B cells are generated, generated in the bone marrow every day. You have billions of new B cells that are generated in the bone marrow and they are attracted in the lymph nodes and they just go and sit there and wait, relax, until eventually something that they know how to recognize, get them out of their, out of their nap and get them all excited and they start doing something. So what enables us to respond to most everything is that we have uh, uh, what we call this germline configuration. I mean, the, the array of the, the, the type of receptors, I would need tons of different cups of various colors and shapes and everything to, to enable binding at least closely to anything. Now, if you have a very good antigen, very a potent antigen, it means you have a lot of this, we'll go to that. If you have an antigen that is poorly recognized, it, it means that in the germline, in the basic repertoire, you mostly have this type of binding and it's more difficult. So initially it's random, and then we will see how it becomes more specific. Okay, I think there was another question in the back and then over there. Hi, my name is Megan and I'm from the US. When you say that the polysaccharide vaccines induce this this hypo response is that because when the sugar comes in it collects so many of the b cells or or is there some other mechanism at work here yeah there is, there is another mechanism which is essentially that uh, polysaccharides do not induce memory uh, and i will show you that they do not induce memory because they do not fit in the niche in the antigen presenting niche of t cells so B cells that are specific of a sugar, of a polysaccharide, do not get help from T cells. And so they do what they do, but it's not their best. Uh, then in addition, you have such a repetitive structure that indeed, if this was full of caps like this, and I have a few B cells or antibodies floating around, I will, I will deplete them more easily than if I have an antigen that is very diverse and can recruit many different type of cells. So I think the two uh, uh, play a role. And there were two questions and then I move on. Yes, then in, one in the back. Hi, Aaron Staples, US. Um, so based on your presentation, which is excellent, thank you. Um, I was just curious how you would document a primary vaccine failure, because you had noted that you might see low levels of 
an antigen because the B cells will mop up most of it when you're exposed. And then you also notice an increase in antibody titers, you know, with re-exposure. I was just kind of curious yes. how you would best document a- Can your curiosity thing. wait for a few more minutes? Sure. Great, <laughs> because I'm, yeah, that's a, a good bridge to what comes next. Okay, so let's go. So this is the link to what I just said. If you want to generate a good B cell response, you, re you need a little bit of help from your friends. And the B cell friends are T cells and specific T cells, especially CD4 follicular T cells, but let's not enter into the details. They help B cell survival, proliferation, differentiation into plasma cells, getting affinity maturation, which means getting really good at binding to, to their antigen switching and all that. Uh, and um, this, for, the, for those who want to know a bit more, is all mediated through different type of interactions between B cells in blue and T uh, uh, cells in red. And there are specific signals that generate all this. So to make a good B cell response, you need to involve some T cells as helper. Now, how do we do that? Now, this is the $1 million question because you have antigen floating around somewhere in the deltoid. And in the lymph nodes, you have B cells and T cells that do not talk to each other in, in distinct area, right? So what you have to do now, and that you know how to do very well, is to become expert at, at organizing a get together party. You know how to do that. You define the best party place. You enthusiastically invite all the participants. You create a hotspot, which is the bar. You generate an intimate environment with handsome guys and beautiful girls, no gender bias. You provide goodies for all to remain at the bar as long as you want them around. And at some point you're tired and you have to clean your house entirely. So you provide them signals that they should go to an after and get out. So this is exactly what happens in an lymph node. Let's see. Again, in the square of a lymph node, the antigen diffuses through the lymphatics and they are brought to the B cell place. And, but now we zoom in and we see that in this B cell follicle, there are uh, cells which we call follicular dendritic cells simply because they have like lots of arms like calamars or pulps. And they grab the antigens and you can think of these cells like sponges. They are little sponges for antigens. They retain the antigens in, in a B cell follicle, okay? And uh, so that's step one, you need to have something to some food, some drinks, some uh, whatever at the bar, otherwise no one will come to your party. Then vaccine uh, antigens are uh, also brought by white blood cells, dendritic cells mainly, to the border between the B cell and the T cell zone. And this is the smart move, because if you need to talk to people on of both sides of the fence, this is where you go, right? You go to the border. And they arrive there with the alarm signals and say, oh my God, this is so nice. There's this party ongoing, you should get excited. And what happens is that those who are specific B cells and T cells who are capable of recognizing the antigen, they say, well, let's go. I know this guy or this girl, she always makes great party. Let's go there. And guess what? This is exactly what happens. Uh, I don't need this one, in fact, it's the next one. Uh, yes, this is what happens. Uh, B cells that are specific of the antigen, follicular T cells that are specific of the antigen migrate to the B cell follicle where they find the sponges with the antigen. So all of a sudden you have everything that you need. You have food, you have drink, and you have all the participants that are there. And this is what we call the germinal center. And that's the second concept I want you to bring home. Germinal center is a B cell factory. This is where B cells learn to do everything they need to learn and to become really good at. Uh, they learn tons of things in these, uh, in these uh, uh, germinal centers. First, they proliferate, as you see here. 
they switch from IgM to IgG, IgA or IgE, depending on the environment. They become much better at producing antibodies. You see these cells are much bigger than these ones. Well, let's say they are much bigger. So they produce much more uh, antibodies. And they also compete between each other to get closest to the bar as possible. So the best ones win. So the B cells that get out of the germinal center, they have competed with everyone and they are just the one who are best capable of getting yet another beer or whatever. And um, this is the result, uh, the result of this germinal center process, maturation, selection, competition, you put, it, put the word that you, that you want, is that you now have plasma cells that again, do not stay in the lymph node, migrate into the blood, but produce much better and much more antibodies, such that the, the, the increase of antibodies is going to be much faster, much higher. Yeah, it, uh, not much faster because it still takes about 10 to, 10 to 14 days to see antibodies appear uh, uh, in the best case. And then the peak is still uh, approximately one month after injection. Then what happens is that, unfortunately, after a party, you're exhausted, which means that 90% of these plasma cells will not survive. They will die in the blood where they do not find uh, uh, goodies to survive more than for a couple of uh, uh, weeks. And you will see antibody titers go down relatively rapidly in a first uh, uh, period. But a few lucky or smart plasma cells manage to reach another body compartment, which is the bone marrow. And in the bone marrow, you, you have specific stromal cells that produce other types of goodies, survival goodies, survival niches. Oh, this is a place where I can sit and rest for 20 years and produce anti-tetanus antibodies without being disturbed. Great. So the lucky ones end up there and they are called long-lived plasma cells. And you, if you have antibodies against tetanus today, unless you had a shot very recently, it's because in your bone marrow, you have these cells that day after day, minute after minute produce uh, anti-tetanus uh, uh, antibodies. They are responsible for uh, prolonged antibody persistence. Uh, and so of course, uh, yes, well, I can show it here. Uh, the first shape is the same as we have seen, delay, peak, sh sharp decline as short-lived plasma ballast die. But then you have a second curve, which can be a plateau sometimes like HPV goes down so slowly that you have fo to follow it for years and years to see it decline. Others decline, unfortunately, more rapidly. Uh, and this number four is this plateau or slow decline is proportional to the number of long-lived plasma cells that you were able to generate with your vaccines. So as a parenthesis, we could say, you heard yesterday a first lecture on COVID vaccine. You could say COVID vaccines so far are, are not very good at inducing long-lived plasma cells. They are quite good at inducing early responses, protecting high level for a short time, and then, blah, blah, blah. okay, next generation will have uh, to come. So this is what you did. The best party place is the B cell follicle. Well, you attract everyone. Uh, you bring uh, into the germinal center is the bar. So that you should be able to remember. You have follicular dendritic cells, the little sponges as madams. Um, goodies, antigen and survival, survival signals, and then at, the, at some point, everyone changes its receptor direction and go, goes to another place because that's the end of the germinal center. That duration is about six weeks. The, the duration of one of all this process with, within one germinal center is approximately six to eight uh, uh, weeks. Are you all lost? No. no. Now you know how to organize a party. And you know that you're doing that every time that you respond to a vaccine or an infection. Questions? Yes, please. 
Hi, thanks for stopping for a question. Um, my name is Heather Platt. I work at Merck in vaccine research. The statement you just made about um, we don't think that COVID vaccines have long lived responses. Do we know that for sure yet without really looking at the marrow or have we been able to really mark you know, the decline in the plasma cells? Has enough time passed for us to really know if people will be able to respond over time? You are absolutely right. And that was a bit of a shortcut. I should have said long, la long lasting antibody responses, right? Because at some point, and I think it's now we'll go into memory. And, uh, and, uh, and then what protects you against what is, is obviously what you should be at at the end of the day uh, uh, of today. So I should have said sustained antibody responses is not what vaccines current, COVID vaccines currently do the best. Yeah, I see you. Fine. Yes. Hello, uh, very nice presentation. I'm Disha from India. Uh, I just wanted to know uh, what is the difference in the immunological response when we consider the primary dose and the uh, booster dose? Okay, wait for memory. Okay. Anything that relates to a primary response? Yes. Thank you very much. I'm Charlotte from Cameroon. I wanted to find out, uh, you know, using the party illustration, what about uh, multiple uh, antigens that are administered at the same time, like the yeah. pentavalent vaccine yeah. is like organizing. Yeah, the very good. So once. in a lymph node, first you have many lymph nodes. And in a lymph node, you have many different germinal centers. Every germinal center is only specific of one antigen. And initially in, induced by one B cell, right? So every germinal center is specific. But within a lymph node, you can have germinal centers against one part of diphtheria, another tetanus, another rib, another whatever. So, so this is the multiplicity of the system. You, you just add levels to what I showed you. That's, that's how it works. Exactly the same thing. Yes? So Sita from Copenhagen, um, some patients, they just uh, never respond to the polysaccharide vaccine yeah. for the first of these. Yes. Um, because it's a poor happen? vaccine. Let's say, because it's a poor stimulator of the immune system. There is nothing as boring as a sugar, except if you want to eat it. But uh, it's a repetitive structure. It doesn't look dangerous. It doesn't feel dangerous. It doesn't activate T cells. It, so if you, have, if you don't have a very fit immune system, if you've not been exposed to the bug before in presence of proteins and so on, to make a response to a pure polysaccharide, which is high and long lasting is really a challenging stuff. So maybe 5% of your population will do it, but not the overall population. Okay, and if you're a bit immunosuppressed or whatever, um, uh, uh, it will become very difficult. Yes, you, and then in the back. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is uh, Hagi Ibrahim Ture from Senegal. My question is, it is possible to have uh, some drugs who interfer, give uh, interference with the uh, vaccine? Some what? Some drugs, some medication. Medi some drugs who interfere yeah. with vaccines? Yeah. Uh, well, immunosuppressive drugs, of course. If you are if you are under immunosuppression, if you have no B cells, because your B cells attack your own body, you make no plasma cells. And if you make no plasma cells, you make no antibodies. If you have uh, dampened T cells because you receive treatment against another type of disease and your T cells are poor. They will, you will raise very poor response. You will have a specific lecture on immunization of the immunocompromised next week by Janet England. You will love it. HIV and everything, and cancer and everything. Okay, um, let me see where we are. Uh, yes, I want to, do, uh, to, to go through that before uh, uh, you eventually want to go to coffee. So now that you understand that an immune response elicited by a, a, a vaccine is nothing but activating T and B cells, generating plasma cells, having them survive for a few, I mean, generate uh, short-term plasma cells and having them survive in the, in the bone marrow, I could ask you which are the essential factors that make that some vaccines induce higher responses than others. Okay, I'm not asking yet about longer, but higher. 
the peak response. Can you just throw at me what, whatever you think pl plays a role? How do you make a vaccine induce a higher response? Adjuvant. What does an adjuvant do? It acts where, hold up. Where does it, where does it act? Here, activation. What else? Dose. Uh, the dose, if you, if you inject more antigen, you recruit more B cells, you induce more uh, uh, parties, more germinal center reaction, and so on. To a certain point, at some point, you, do, uh, you don't increase anymore. What else? Repetition, that's memory. In administration site. Uh, yes, like mucosal versus parenteral or things like that. Bringing proteins, everything. Okay, what you, uh, uh, and what we should not forget is that some of these determinants come from the host, just what you said. So yes, the type of antigen, tetanus is a much stronger antigen than diphtheria, right? There is nothing you can do about that. It relates to, to your question, uh, uh, LK. There are many more B cells who can recognize tetanus parts than diphtheria to, uh, parts, and that's nature. So with some antigens, it's much more difficult than with others. The dose, the, the repertoire, this is just what we discussed. The activation status of your antigen presenting cells, this is if you're stressed, if you're tired, this is innate immunity, this is if you're, and so on and so on. Your immune system is like not as fit. Uh, and um, and uh, that's on the low side. And on the positive side is what you can bring is danger signals and adjuvants, of course, and you will have specific lectures on, on how they uh, uh, increase inflammatory response and shape exactly the type of uh, 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 activation that, that uh, takes place here. So uh, this is what controls the peak. And the same is true for what controls the persistence. So the duration of antibody response depends on the, num the quality of the activation, the number of plasma cells that you were capable of inducing, and how well or how many of these plasma cells survived and made it to the bone marrow and stayed there for a long time. Same factors. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. So uh, the main factors is, again, number of long-lived plasma cells and how they survive in the bone marrow niche. We know a bit on this. We know very little on survival factors in the bone marrow, only in mice and, and very little. It's still an area of intense investigation or it should be an area of intense investigation. Now, at some point, these antibodies are going to go back to baseline or to go below protective threshold and we will need to reactivate memory, to reactivate immune response. And this is where we need to bring in memory. So I suggest you go for a coffee because I think that's the, the timing is appropriate. So you can let all this rest a bit and take its place. And please come back as soon as you can, because I still have a few things I can tell you. No, I'm kidding. If you can come back at, a 15, uh, at 15 past 10, it would be great. OK? Thanks. Thanks.